<laughs> Recording in progress. Yep, we're on. How are you, man? I'm tired. <laughs> tired of thinking? Tired of praying? I'm tired of thinking. I'm tired of, of uncertainty. You know what you need to do? What do I need to do, Kyle? You need to go on a fast. <laughs> yeah? <laughs> of, of just like go to the wilderness or? Well, I don't know. I don't know. I just think it's, I've been thinking that this is pretty timely conversation with you trying to figure out what in the world the Lord wants you to do. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. Matthew 5, right? Matthew 6. Matthew 6, that's right. Matthew 6, starting at verse 16. Is that what it is? All right, let me get there myself. I think so. Yeah, it's a short, it's a short passage. Um, so we got a lot of time to explore kind of the concept of fasting. Well, you know, just gosh, for modern years, well, although it's becoming more more popular, and we'll talk about that for a, for a moment. Yeah. But uh, but it yeah, it's a generally speaking for the West, it's a strange thing, but it hasn't always been that way. Um, so we'll let's talk about that and see what kind of wisdom we can we can pull out. Excited for a history lesson. Yeah, yeah. Matthew's uh vacationing is his last blast of summer so enjoy it that's enjoy right it, matthew absolutely okay so let's uh well let's pray and uh i guess i'll have some introductory things and we'll see where the lord takes us so lord we already thank you for this opportunity lord to explore what really in the history of your church history of your people have been a has been a central spiritual discipline which is really kind of hasn't been practiced in an intentional way broadly in, in the church in the West for a long time. So Lord, I just pray that as we share together, that you would quicken us around this, uh, this ancient discipline of fasting and be with Matthew as he's with, uh, you know, the family down there on the coast. Amen. Amen. What's interesting if you, uh, as I did, you know, you just put fast or fasting in us, you know, in your Bible gateway or, or you know, whatever software you got, what becomes really apparent is that fasting is spoken a lot in the Old Testament, uh, in the Gospels, and in Acts, but the Apostle Paul never mentions it in any of his letters. So that, yeah, it's a little interesting detail. So you go, huh, why is that? And I'm thinking it was such an um, understood practice, Paul didn't have to address it. Hmm. And that seems to be what, what Jesus uh, as, as we read this text, he doesn't say you ought to fast. He says, when you fast, right? He presumed. Assume, yeah, assume yeah, he, yeah. And I think it was, it was just, it was just a regular sort of deal. Um, you know, the, the ancient world, uh, you know, those, those Greek philosophers, of course, Hinduism, Buddhism, you know, all, all the ancient traditions, fasting was a, was a pretty regular part of, of life which is which is interesting and in the contemporary day fasting has kind of become a, a health thing a health thing right there's you know there's intermittent fasting right where you're supposed to eat what have not eat with eat within an eight hour window and then go 16 hours without in without eating so your body can do whatever it does and, and then when, when you don't eat uh, you know, there's also been, I've seen guys talk about the value of long-term, you know, longer-term fasting, uh, you know, not just the intermittent fasting thing. So, <clears throat> and, and I, on this, is this, so this is, I guess, a clarifying thing. Fasting in the Old Testament is, it, and, and the New Testament, in the Bible, is it specifically talking about fasting from food? Because, like, growing up, you know, people talk about taking a, like, fasting is synonymous with taking a break from anything like people do a technology fast or you know things like that so in the bible when the word fast like fasting is it always it's around food or is it just the concept of removing something for a time i think it's around i, I think it's specifically around food although you do see like the nazarite vow which was abstaining from wine okay um uh Gosh, was there any anything around chastity? Um, you know, there might be, you know, abstaining from sexual relations. I, I'd have to look at that. 
uh, specifically. But yeah, I think I think when the Bible speaks of fasting, it speaks specifically about food, because I think there's something that uh, that goes on chemically in the body that that the Lord is aware of, and that kind of dials us in. And I think that's what's you know, food, of course, is central to the human experience. <laughs> we eat or we die, yeah. right? And so it's strange. I mean, here's this, here's this practice of not eating, hmm. you know, and it's supposed to having, even having some profound benefits. So, I mean, and you just, so I just put in those Google uh, benefits of fasting, right? Just, you know, just to see what's out there. So this is from a, strictly from a physiological perspective, just 11 benefits of fasting. Um, regrowth of the brain. Okay. So there's something going on in the brain when you fast. Uh, increased mitochondria, which is the part of the cell which processes energy. Autophagy, and that's the body dealing with dead cells, clearing the dead cells out of your body, which affects aging, okay? Uh, enhanced stem cell production, decreased inflammation, decreased tumor growth. So now that's interesting. Uh, cancer cells love high blood sugar. And so fasting that, you know, shifts to ketones, you know, what's, what, what, what is released when the insulin drops in your body, you know, it, it impacts cancer. So, yeah, decreased uh, tumor growth, increased antioxidants, cell resistance to stress, of course, blood sugar control, uh, increased human growth hormone levels, which which has to do with like muscle uh, repair, and then of course weight weight loss support. Um, you know, I was <laughs> sounds pretty good. Yeah, yeah, you know, and and you know, I, I, I'm, and I, I've got some personal experience just with intermittent fasting and ketosis and ketones and what happens when your blood sugar. You know, we've had lots of conversations about that over the years because you know it's really had a dramatic impact on my own physical, you know, life. And so there's there's really stuff go, going on there, but I don't want to focus on that stuff. You know that. I mean, let's let's get at the spiritual stuff because that's what Jesus is, of course, is calling us to, and that's what most fake, most folks I think are interested in. Also, I mean, also just noting that uh, you know, in the genius of God, doing you know, t creating a discipline that is both good spiritually and physically, right? You know, yeah, just because sure. he cares about both. Yeah, yeah. And it, well, it speaks to the integration of the, you know, body of the embodied soul, right? I mean, mm, yeah, yeah, yeah. Of, of course, it would be kind of in a way for both. Yeah, yeah. Hey, well, why, why don't you go ahead and read Matthew 6, um, uh, 16 through 18. And we'll, uh, we'll just kind of get that on the table. And we'll go from there. And when you fast, do not look gloomy, like the hypocrites. For they disfigure their faces that their fasting may be seen by others. Truly, I say to you, they have received the reward. But when you fast, anoint your head and wash your face, that your fasting may not be seen by others, but by your Father who is in secret. And your Father who sees in secret will reward you. You know, when you fast, do not look gloomy. That's what ESV says. Do not look gloomy for they disfigure their faces, right? And so that's, it's like you're fasting for the crowd, right? Yeah, yeah. So, so Jesus assumes the the practice of fasting, but but he recognizes that that thumos can be like, part of it. The dynamic, like, look. You can't escape it. <laughs> you, you can't, yeah. I mean, it's, it's so dramatic, I think, in in, uh, in Jesus's world. Like, he, he just nails them. Guys, you don't fast in order to impress others or to be validated by the crowd, right? Don't, don't even go there. Mm -hmm. And this is the third time that Jesus mentions in this illuminative way, chapter six, you know, do it in secret and your father will reward you. Do it in secret. Your father will reward you. Do it in secret mm -hmm. and your father will reward you. So I just want to emphasize again which I, th I think is going, to, is, is going to be for me just a central theme throughout chapter six. What Matthew, when he preached a couple of weeks ago, you know, the seething world, a secret place. I think that so, so, so captures the, you know, the dynamic that, 
the Lord wants to, to, I think whatever else is going on fasting, you know, deepening and empowering that secret place with the Lord is certainly hmm. part and parcel of what's going on there. Yeah. yeah. I, I, uh, it's just a great, it's just a great reminder that, uh, I, I know not everyone struggles with, with people pleasing this, but for, for someone like me and just the family that I grew up in, that was just a, such a core struggle that has always been, I think, well, you know, I don't know how long it'll, it might always stay the core struggle of my, my family, but, uh, this idea of, yeah, doing things for others or doing things so that others can see or, or so that others are, or are happy or pleased. And, uh, it's, it's a refreshing reminder that that's not a new <laughs> struggle. You know, like this no, is something that no. has been, I think pretty, yeah, it just the pride or, or, uh, arrogance. I can, it's kind of a, the underlying issue of that, right? It's just this anti-humility of wanting to be seen by others and to look good by the world. And then again, just the truly, I say to you, they have received their reward, which is like, when you read it, it's like, oh man, like, they missed out like they they got something but it definitely wasn't the thing to get you know right that's right it was interesting uh i mean numerous times in, in the old testament the uh, the prophets hammered what do you call the false fast or the manipulating fast right mm -hmm. you know or the fast that's not for its intended purpose so isaiah 58 3 uh, I mean, Isaiah 58 is just a powerful chunk. I mean, a powerful rebuke. Uh, but just dialing on verse, di dialing in on verse three. Why have we fasted and you see it not? Why have we humbled ourselves and you have no knowledge of it? Behold, in the day of your fast, you seek your own pleasure and oppress all your workers. Hmm. Hmm. So fasting as an outward religious act, but not you know, not, I, a, a, you know, a, a true validation of your relationship with the Lord and the commit and the community <laughs> commitment to the Lord. I think, I think also the idea of seeking your own, you, you, you sought your own pleasure during it really speaks to me because of, I, we talked about this briefly last time, but just to kind of dive into it again, um, growing up in, in, in a church setting and picking up Again, not no one telling me this, no one teaching this, uh, like outright, but just picking up the cues when, oh, when people have serious prayers, I hear them talk about will fast, or or when someone, you know, someone someone has cancer, um, and it's like like we need to pray and we're gonna fast, you know, and I assumed and what I what I kind of learned or intuited from that was that oh you fast to get what you want. You have a, a you have a better chance of getting what you want when you fast, um, and I saw it as that. And I remember I moved to Los Angeles. It was a couple of years in. Uh, I really wanted to get this this job, and I was like, I, I was I, I was by myself. Like I'm gonna fast. I'm gonna, I'm gonna spend a whole day. I'm gonna fast about it. And I went in, ate nothing, wrote scripture on the wall, like meditated on it. And I was like, man, God's gonna take me really seriously. Like there's like I'm doing it. I'm doing it all. You know. And uh, didn't get the job, and I was so confused. I was so I was like, I fasted, I fasted, and I meditated. I did all these things, um, and it didn't and I, work. And it didn't work. And and I think right there, ultimately, in that moment, it's just it's it's kind of also touches on a few uh, podcasts ago about you know, Lord knows what you need before you ask, so therefore pray like this, and how God gives us what we need, not what we want. So this idea of when I you know in those times I was fasting seeking my own pleasure i was i was fasting for the things that i wanted and not so i could get closer to jesus not so that i could just spend time with him practicing this thing that he says is good to practice for whatever reason is good which i'm excited to learn more about today of like the the kind of the right mindset to do it but yeah just just doing it seeking our own pleasure is not the not the idea right and it and and that's just a clear picture of uh gosh what's the the, the you know the the deep-rooted pattern of i do it for me you know that yeah. and yeah. 
and you're not even conscious of the fact that you're doing it, but the Lord is. I, th- I, th- I think that's where Isaiah 58, verse 3, the rebuke. Behold, in the day of your fast, you seek your own pleasure. And they're saying, no, we don't. God's saying, yes, you are. <laughs> yeah, yeah, oh, yeah. yes. Yeah. Right. And and the difficulty of that, which, which kind of points to uh, uh, kind, kind of the need to fast. Because we have those patterns, those learned behaviors that are so deeply ingrained in us, they don't easily go away. Well, I think fasting might be a a strategic way to get at that, Hmm. you know? Hmm. So what I thought we would do is, um, you know, take a look at a number of Old Testament passages and, and New Testament. I got some New Testament passages in there from Gospel and the Acts, the Apostles that, uh, that kind of get at that. Um, yeah. And it's there in verse 17. I mean, just to, sit, just to read that. But when you fast, again, Jesus assuming, assuming the practice, and then we see it often in, in, um, in the Old Testament Gospels and Acts. So, uh, you know, it's not, it was not nearly as rare in Jesus's day as it is in ours. And so we can kind of comb the scriptures and say, okay, what, what was fasting about in, you know, in, in the Bible and to, and just do what we find. Yeah. And I think also to kind of preface it, one thing that I want to be, be aware, uh, not wary of, uh, be, be aware of is that when I like, when I hear this concept, what I want to know is like, okay, how often should I fast? Is it a once a week thing? Is it a once a month thing? How should I do it? Right. I want to start creating rules around it. So I want to be careful of that uh, when learning this. Um, so I guess my desire is like, I want to understand the heart of this uh, and not necessarily the religiosity of it. Because, you know, I think I think it's easy to, because you, you I think people can even use this as a point of pride, right? Like, oh, I fast every week. I fast once a week. Uh, and that becomes an identity and it then... Yeah, I mean that. I mean that. I guess that goes back to like truly, they have received the reward if they're. That's probably them doing it for other people. But so yeah, I mean just just as I you know I'm wanting to learn more about this. I really want to you know I guess it's all the spiritual disciplines, and this might be a broader question, which is you know what how often do you practice them? How often do you practice the liturgical prayer? How often do you practice the silence? How often do you practice fasting? You know. Um, and what is it? Is it just kind of you figure out what works for you, or is it there is a there are traditional ways of doing it that seem helpful? And um, yeah, just some just some some of the the angles I'm coming at it. Uh, yeah, yeah, those are great questions. And and I mean, and the basic answer is do what Jesus tells you to do, right? I mean, that's part that's part of the illuminative way. Is it's like uh, chapter six, Matthew chapter six. He doesn't tell us what to do. It's like this is all about opening ourselves to his presence in a deeper, more intentional way. Hmm. Why? Well, so he can be specific about how he, how he leads us so we can learn to hear his voice. So, right. So how do you do that? Okay. There's quote traditional ways. Okay. What, what patterns do we see in church history? You know, you know, the heroes of the of church history, you know, the, of the John Wesley's and those guys, what, you know, what was their practice? Hmm. Um, and then, you know, getting with a, you know, a spiritual director, you know, a mentor and just, and, and, and just having conversation and listening for the Lord through that conversation, you know, all those ways are ways that the Lord will, will lead us in cultivating a, what, uh, what Matthew practices, or at least is, is talked about developing a rule of life, which is, okay, what are the practices that, I, you know, what are the disciplines that I'm going to practice on a regular basis? And being intentional about developing that, yeah, a rule of life, right? right. So, and and and, I'm, and the Lord wants to lead us, right? And and He will lead us uniquely, right? <laughs> which you know, which is why you don't get the spiritual growth manual and you know, <laughs> right. go go through the ten lessons and be fixed. No, that's not that's not how Jesus works. Okay, so 617, so when you fast, so, so Jesus presumes the practice of fasting. And I, I think the anchoring place to go is, is Leviticus 23, 27 through 29. 
uh, where the word um, fasting isn't in there, but the, uh, afflict yourselves or humble yourselves. That, that's the term that, that's used. And you look at the practice of the, of the Jews and what they did is they fasted on the day of atonement. And so they, so they understood that as a call to an annual fast. So if you got that up, got, yeah, read it 27 through 29, Leviticus 23, 27 through 29. Uh, I'm going to start in 26. And the Lord spoke to Moses saying, now on the 10th day of this seventh month, this is the day of atonement. It shall be for you a time of holy convocation and you shall afflict yourselves and present a food offering to the Lord. And you shall not do any work on that very day for it is a day of atonement to make atonement for you before the Lord your God. For whoever is not afflicted on that very day shall be cut off from his people. Okay. And we can understand that word afflicted. I mean, just but through the practice of Israel, you know, through the centuries is, you know, is, is fasting. And, and you, boy, you get that. Whoever is not afflicted on that very day shall be cut off from his people. Okay. There's, there, there's something powerfully go, powerful going on there. Yeah. And just some, I mean, observations that, I mean, there's nothing astute about this, but you know, it was regular. You know, it was an annual uh, practice. You know, Yom Kippur, it was, you know, the Day of Atonement. Um, it was national, right? Everybody was, you know, you know, you know was involved and, uh, and they took it seriously. It was, it, it, it was a call. Um, and this, and the, and the word afflict yourselves, I think is, is interesting. Um, and, and my hunch is, I mean, to get a sense of what's going on there, go to James chapter four. Um, I, I think James might have the day of atonement in mind in this, in this classic passage, James four, one through 10. It's long, it's a long passage, but, uh, but it's worth hearing. What causes quarrels and what causes fights among you? Is it not this? that your passions are at war within you. You desire and do not have, so you murder. You covet and cannot obtain, so you fight and quarrel. You do not have because you do not ask. You ask and you do not receive because you ask wrongly to spend it on your passions, you adulterous people. Do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? Therefore, whoever wishes to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. Or do you suppose it is to no purpose that the scripture says he yearns jealously over the spirit that he has made to dwell in us? But he gives more grace. Therefore, it says God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Submit yourselves, therefore, to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Be wretched and mourn and weep. Let your laughter be turned to mourning and your joy to gloom. Humble yourselves before the Lord, and he will exalt you. Yeah, humble yourselves before the Lord. Hmm. I mean that. I mean that feels to me like the Day of Atonement uh, practice. You know, uh, you know, this is coming from a guy who who you know followed Jesus deeply in the ritual pattern of his nation. I mean, and the first part of that, you know, the the manipulative prayer. You know, you yeah, you, know, you pray yeah. to to serve your own passions, and and this call to well. It sounds like afflicting yourself to me, be wretched and mourn and weep. Mm. And, you know, that, that feels like, boy, that, that feels like the fast to me, mm. right? There's this, there's this humbling of, of the self before God, as you're kind of moving into different space. And but that's what it, it feels like that to me. How, how about you? Does that, is it, does it kind of resonate with you that way? It, it, I mean, I see the connection. It definitely makes sense. And, and the first, like, the first, like, 
uh, uh, response I have, you know, is like, man, why would God want us to, why would God want this? You know, like the, 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 I think that's <laughs> a very joyful person. I'm a naturally very joyful guy. And, and I see, you know, often through scripture, these passages or in Psalms and, and this, this, this call to mourn and this call to lament and this call to uh, weep and my laughter return to mourning and my joy to gloom. Uh, and, and I think like the first question is why, <laughs> you know, you know, why, 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 why does, what does God see? You know, what is the good that God sees in that? How does, how does doing this, how does fat, how does cutting myself off from food, which is, which is sustainable for life and delicious and good, you know, like how, how does cutting that off for a time, making my body crave it and, and ache and, you know, what, how, how is like, why does my God want me to do that? What is the deeper good that comes from it? I think that's the first, (laughs) that's like the first question I have. Well, let's read on and see if that gets answered. And if it doesn't get answered, let's let's revisit it. Love okay. it, love it. So, so First Samuel seven six, right? Fasting as repentance. So when 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 Samuel arrives, you know, arrives, you know, they've been they've been fumbling around against against the Philistines, and and uh, you know the ark is taken and put putting in the the temple of Dagon and the, you know, that's the story of the temple, the, the idol being on ground and, you know, all that. And they send the ark back, but the people are, are powerless, right. They're in, in, in the face of the Philistines and they, you know, and, and, and Samuel gives this passionate call to repentance. And then we get first Samuel seven, six, so, so they gathered at Mizpah and drew water and poured it out before the Lord and fasted on that day and said there, we have sinned against the Lord. And Samuel judged the people of Israel at Mizpah, which means he took leadership over the people uh, of Israel at Mizpah. And then there was the great victory. I mean, there's it, this tremendous thing where, where Israel under the leadership of Samuel, routes the Philistines, but it's the Lord's battle. I mean, it's, it's not like David taking out Goliath or, you know, Gideon in the 300. No, it's just, it's just God somehow defeats, you know, the Philistines. So in, in this repentance, there's this notion, okay, we've been, we've been relying on our own strength. Right. Right. We, we've presumed upon Hey, let's go fight. The Lord is with us, and God is sitting back saying, "Well, what makes you think so?" <laughs> I'm, I'm not with you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah just yeah, you know, just because you're shouting my name, you know, doesn't mean I'm with you because you you know you, you know you're you're not in touch with me, and 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 you know that's ex- you know so Samuel calls the people to account, and they right they reorient, they repent, they. And, and fasting was the part, you know, was, you know, was a part of that, this, and, and I think the, you know, the energy drain, you know, you know, before you have big contest, whatever sports event, you know, you want to eat well, you know, you want to be, be fortified so you can do your best. Yeah. Now, this is the opposite of that, right? This is, no, I'm going to, I'm going to put myself in a, in, in a weakened state yeah. physically kind of being aware, you know, to, to align my, my spiritual desperation, you know, so my body feels like that, right? So there's, all the horses are getting in alignment with what I'm intending my, myself to be in that, in that repentant place. Yeah. Aren't there others, other Old Testament stories like that, where like the army, like God called them to intentionally, like either remove their armor or basically like like put themselves at a disadvantage uh to then seek victory so they wouldn't think that it was oh it was because of us that we did this oh yeah and and the biggest probably is gideon right where god whittles down his army to three oh, right 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 right, right. That's what it is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah yeah you know so the victory you know the victory is the lord's yeah for sure yeah okay let's go to another place we see fasting uh Second Samuel 12, 16, and you go there. So, you know, so this is, 
uh, after Bathsheba. That story is 2 Samuel, you know, 11. And, you know, we all know the story. David sleeps with Bathsheba, sends her husband Uriah to the front lines. Uh, he gets killed. Nathan, the prophet, comes and tells the, you know, the parable of this rich man. He stole his, his neighbor's lamb. And, and David says, off with his head. And Nathan points his bony finger at Samuel and okay. says, you are the man. Yeah. Right. And. You know, David is undone. He repents. Uh, the child of their of their sexual union is is frail and, and is dying. And so we pick it up at 2 Samuel 12, 16. David therefore sought God on behalf of the child. And David fasted and went in and lay all night on the ground. Okay. So boy, that's a man, he wants his baby boy to live. Right. This this deep intercession, this, you know, somehow this is what I want. And and fasting somehow brings that in alignment. But but keep reading verse 17 and possible next. And the elders of his house stood beside him to raise him from the ground, but he would not, nor did he eat food with them. On the seventh day, the child died. And the servants of David were afraid to tell him the child was dead. For they said, behold, while a child was yet alive, we spoke to him and he did not listen to us. How then can we say to him, the child is dead? He may do himself some harm. But when David saw that his servants were whispering together, David understood the child was dead. And David said to his servants, is the child dead? And they said, he is. Then David arose from the earth and washed and anointed himself and changed his clothes, and he went into the house of the Lord and worshipped. He then went to his own house, and when he asked, they set food before him, and he ate. Wow. His son dies in the midst of David's fast, and what does David do? He goes to worship. So there's this dynamic of, boy, this is, I desperately desire this. This is what I want, and he's fasting, and God says no. And David says, okay. Okay. And worships the Lord. So there's, so, so that, I mean, I hear that as some kind of dialing in, man, I know what I want and I know what I want desperately. The key question is, what does the Lord want? And that goes back to, you know, the Lord's prayer, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on well, earth as it is in heaven. And then, then, and then the struggle of, the circle of Jesus the night before, you know, he was betrayed. The, yeah. I know what I desperately want. Yeah. And he didn't get it, you know? Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, and, and, and so fasting somehow, you know, is the occasion of, of that deep wrestling. Hmm. And we could say with the Lord, but every, every bit, every bit as much as with oneself. You know, you know, dialing in to what God intends, and for David, dialing in with you know with, with his own sin and the consequences of his sin, and, you know, and all of that. Oh my gosh! I mean, imagine what was going on in David's prayer life as he's fasting. You know, he's in this different state of orientation, which is what fasting kind of puts you into. Wow! You know, powerful. So, you know, bringing your deepest desires, fasting, but not to manipulate God to giving you what you want, dialing you in to what God wants, mm. right in that and, fast. Yeah, and and not, and also I just want to be careful of like the Chris. I feel like there's a Christianese temptation to never tell God what you want. You know, where it's where you know people will will come to God. And they'll put on like the only thing that they feel like they can say to God is your will be done, you know, but I feel like that's such a, that keeps you from an intimacy of, of really honestly, Raleigh coming before, before the father, like David did here. He, 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 he was, he was desperate in his want and yet still okay with the answer. Yeah. Okay. As you can be when your child has died, you know, which I'm sure was still rough and hard and he mourned for a long time but 
Yeah, I, I mentioned Andrew Murray's book with Christ in the School of Prayer, and that, and 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 when I said, um, you know, Andrew Murray paraphrases, you know, God always answers yes, no, maybe, and and Andrew Murray rejects that out of hand. He just categorically rejects that, and he comes right here to the James passage we read. Uh, you ask and do not receive because you ask wrongly to spend it on your passions, and. Andrew Murray recognizes that with Christ in the school of prayer and that wrestling is dialing into what God wants. You'll find the answer. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, and fasting somehow facilitates that, I think, in a, hmm. you know, in, in some way. And again, we'll, we'll get to that, you know, before we finished, I've got, I've got, I've got some thoughts about that, but let's go to uh, Ezra eight twenty one. This is the return from exile, Right. You got, you got the story of Nehemiah and, you know, re, rebuilding the walls uh, before Nehemiah, Ezra, Ezra goes back um, and takes kind of the first wave of exiles back to Judah. Uh, do you have 821 pulled up? Go ahead and read it. Then I proclaimed a fast there at the river Ava, that we might humble ourselves before our God to seek from him a safe journey for ourselves, our children, and all our goods. Yeah. And, and in context, he, he knows he ought not to ask the king of Persia for protection because he's, <laughs> he's boasted about Yahweh. He's boasted about the Lord. No, he really needs to depend on the Lord for, you know, for, for safety. And, and so he calls a fast and, and, and again, humble yourself, right? That that's kind of, day of atonement language again you know okay we're going to we're going to depend on the lord for this and this this deeper submission i'm not going to strengthen myself for a possible coming fight i'm going to do somehow empty myself so so that i'm more dependent upon the lord and his presence among us mm. yes it it's starting to seem like a, a really practical showing of like do you yeah do you believe that it is you who accomplishes things or it is god who accomplishes things yeah because because if you if you believe it's you you're gonna keep eating <laughs> you're gonna keep you're gonna keep uh, t building yourself up as much as you can and i and i i i even think about fasting from and there's probably maybe this is oh no i'll, I'll just stay in the food realm I, I was trying to figure out like the fasting or or this this practice of emptying yourself, right. And, and making yourself weaker in a sense. Right. Um, and how that might, how that could apply to, to not just food. Um, you know, but then I just want to also be careful, like not, not being unwise. If you had a, if you had a job interview coming up or you had some, and you know, and instead of <laughs> studying as much as you should, you're like, I'm just going to be, I'm going to yeah. go in blind. It's like, no, yeah. no, that's not, yeah. no, maybe yeah, not. the final. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> the final tomorrow, but instead of studying, I'm going to go to church. Yeah. Yeah, man. Mm, yeah. Maybe, maybe, not. Maybe, maybe, not. maybe you won't want to crack open the text. Yeah. 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 So I think, I think just keeping it in the realm of food right now is simpler. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, okay. So Daniel nine. And, and this, is, this is really, really huge and really dramatic. Uh, Daniel 9, 3. Okay, this is, the, this is where Daniel is wrestling in prayer, and he has the vision of the prince of Persia and all of that dr dramatic cosmic stuff. But ver ver verse 3 kind of opens the, opens the door there. So j j just read verse 3. Then I turned my face to the Lord God, seeking him by prayer and pleas for mercy with fasting and sackcloth and ashes. Okay. Now what, tr actually, I should have had you go back to, uh, uh, go back up to verse two. And the question is what, what, what triggers this fast for Daniel? In the first year of his reign, I, Daniel, perceived in the books the number of years that, according to the word of the Lord, to Jeremiah the prophet, must pass before the end of the desolations of Jerusalem, namely 70 years. Okay. So, you know, Jeremiah, the Lord said through Jeremiah, 70 years. 
right? And then there'll be the, you know, the end of the exile, the end of the desolation of Jerusalem, as, as, Dan, as uh, Daniel puts it. And 70 years is up. And here we sit, you know, Babylon in Persia. Right? That's what triggers the fast. And it's a pretty dramatic story, man. I encourage you, to, if you're listening, and just, just to read that, Daniel 9. And Gabriel eventually shows up, the angel Gabriel, and tells David, tells uh, Daniel, not 70 years, but 70 weeks of years. And so you get this bizarre thing, not 70 years, 70 weeks of years. That means 70 times 70, seven times 70. That means 490 years. Okay. And if you know the Bible story, well, Ezra and Nehemiah return. Okay. What happens 490 years? Jesus. <laughs> <laughs> That's pretty good. That's pretty good, isn't it? <laughs> Jesus shows up. Huh. Wow. Oh my gosh. I mean, that's wow. this is one of those blow your mind <laughs> moments in the scriptures. That's like, amazing. Oh, you know, God does deliver the 70, you know, the you know, the return to exile, but the exile isn't really, isn't really over until Jesus dies for the sins of the world so that God can return hmm. to, you know, to his people. Wow. Because sins have been forgiven. Oh, yeah. You know, that you know, that's huge, right? right? So so there we see, you know, fasting as as you know. Claiming the divine promise, you, you know, uh, you know, entering into what God has clearly promised, but but somehow hasn't shown up yet, hasn't manifested yet, you know. And there's there's something going on there, and you know, and maybe you've misunderstood the promise, or maybe there's more to the promise that your, you know, that your initial understanding doesn't grasp, and fasting is going to open that space to a, you know truer broader deeper understanding hmm. right hmm. so you know something like that yeah. because the fast really is a gear shift on your uh perspective well on your not not just your perspective but on your on your physicality i mean it, ha it has real effects in your brain energy levels and all that kind of stuff attention all that thing all that stuff huh. and i'll say more about that that's at the end but you know, but that's okay. That's interesting. And and then, oh, here, yeah, the New Testament, Acts thirteen two. Uh, of course, you got Jesus in the wilderness, and 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 we'll go there in a second. But Acts thirteen, um, read read one and two. Now, there were in the church at Antioch prophets and teachers, Barnabas, uh, Simeon. Okay, help me here. Niger. It was called uh, Niger. Lucius. Lucius of so, Cyrene. Cyrene. Manian. Manian, a lifelong friend of Herod. 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 The, the Tetrarch. Tetrarch and Saul. Just nailing all those names. Yep. While they were worshiping the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, Set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. Verse three. Then after fasting and praying, they laid their hands on them and sent them off. Wow. First missionary journey. The gospel begins to spread. Wow. While they, so, were, while they were fasting, the Holy Spirit said. Yeah. They were, what's the language? Um, verse while they were worshiping the Lord and fasting. So fasting was connected to worship. Now, did they fast every time they worshiped? Well, you got the Lord's Supper in there, so not necessarily so. That's, that's, that's a hard connection to make. Hmm. Yet, at least this time, <laughs> fasting was connected to, to gathering you know, for worship Sometimes worship around the table or around a meal, sometimes worship in around fasting, and that this strategic moment, dramatic moment, the worshiping and fasting, and the Holy Spirit speaks to them with very clear direction. Hey, set aside Saul and Barnabas for the work I have for them. Wow. Okay. Oh, 
Okay, so this is a this is a corporate fast. Gather together, seek in the Lord together. We have no idea what what prompted this. What was it? Like every other week, we'll worship and fast, or you know, on Wednesdays we'll worship on fat and fast. On Sundays we'll worship around the Lord's table, you know, and take communion. I have no idea. I mean, the, the New Testament that doesn't clue us in. But but you see, worship as I mean, fasting is a part of worship, and Holy Spirit speaks in the midst of that. Hmm. Yeah. Wow. Maybe that's something we ought to do from time to time, hmm. and 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 see what what the Lord might do. Uh, at Grace Fellowship, you know, some of our most powerful moments have been when the Lord has called us to to fast. You know, feed my sheep was was directly related to. Uh, to the Lord calling us to fast. We had a Ken Metz, one of our missionaries had come and, and there was a, on, on, on Sunday morning, he preached and it was just a dramatic Holy spirit manifestation. I mean, it was dramatic what the Holy spirit was doing. I mean, a third, a half of the congregation came forward to, you know, to the altar and, uh, and the elders realized, okay, something's up. The Lord has our attention. And we called, you know, the church to fast. And uh, to, to, to make a long story short, after a week of fasting, we fasted for seven days. Uh, you know, the, you know the, those who could. We, got, we gathered at Candy Dufresne's house to uh, discern what the Lord was saying. And someone spoke the words, feed my sheep. And I'd already been talking to Rick White about feed my sheep. And I about fell out of my chair. Because uh, the person who said that had no idea I was having this conversation. <laughs> and it was clearly that the Lord was saying, do this, do this. And it, and it was a tremendous blessing and powerful things happened over the, you know, three years, three or, three or four years that we were doing it. So, yeah, I've, I've experienced that, man. That's, 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 that's real deal stuff. So, you know, deep listening in the midst of, of worship. Right. So, you know, you know, so we see fasting seems pretty i wouldn't call it well i may maybe normal but it's certainly not unusual it's just named as you know you know something that folks would do during these times during particular times ritually certainly on the day of atonement but in other moments when bad things are happening or we have desperate need or the start of something fresh and new it's a pretty good picture. You know, the other, you know, and, and it's probably the, the, the biggest picture of fasting of, is Jesus in the wilderness, where Jesus goes in to fast for 40 days, uh, and he's tempted, tested, right, by the evil one. Okay, so there's, that, that feels like a time of, of preparation, or you know, yeah. testing as as proving readiness. You know something about that. Um, but it also. I was, thinking, I was just thinking. Then after that, his whole ministry starts. <laughs> well, that's the third thing. It marks a boundary, right? So you're going from kind of this way of being in the world to this way of being in the world. You know, a boundary marker for for Jesus, certainly a special. <laughs> special time of ministry but but I, th I think that you know fasting is a boundary marker when you feel a sense of, of transition right okay god's god's moving moving me or moving us someplace else you know marking that with a fast and you know, just giving the lord every opportunity to, to do whatever he's going to do you know i think that's what's going on there okay so i got five practical thoughts kind of suck i mean just just from my experience with fasting and and uh Ready. just thinking about this stuff well i think and i think uh, the obvious is just it's groundwork for deeper attention to the lord okay just laying the groundwork for deeper attention like i said earlier kind of deepening that that secret place where we meet with the lord and i'm not a i'm not a physiologist in any way but my experience with ketosis, you know, eating, you know, the keto way of eating and what happens when your 
body shifts from using um, glucose as the primary energy of fuel to what's called ketone bodies. Uh, insulin drops dramatically in your body when you're not processing carbohydrates that, that you've eaten. And when your blood sugar, when your insulin drops, what that, that one, one of the things it does is it releases the fat that's stored in your, in your fat cells, in your adipose tissues, that's what it's called. And you start being fueled, not by glucose, a simple sugar, but by these ketones, these ketone bodies. And it has a dramatic, and it has a pretty significant effect on your brain. You know, and, and, and folks have, have documented that. And I, again, I can't say more about that, but I think there's something go, going on there that when you're fat, that, that, that when you fast, especially for an extended time, right, there, there's a significant ge a gear shift. Uh, so that, that's the first thing, this groundwork for giving the Lord more attention. You know, second, as you're entering into a fast, that your, your metabolism begins to slow down. I mean, it's like you're, you're, you're downshifting your car. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Right. That's, what they, that's what everyone feels. That's pretty, yeah. 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 It, it's, it's for real, right? I mean, that's just what you feel. And that's telling us, and you are just fully aware that, okay, I'm entering into a different space. I'm going to intentionally, I'm going to do what my body wants to do. I'm going to slow down. Uh, and the third thing is the investment of time. I mean, the, uh, the best way to fast is, is when you have the opportunity to, to, to set aside extended time, to sit with the Lord for hours. Hmm. I, 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 again, not, I don't want to make a rule for anyone else, but I've learned from my personal experience. I used to, I used to try fasting like during the week, during the work week. And, uh, I, I would, I would become a terrible employee for that day because, you know, I'm, it's like two o'clock, three o'clock and I'm, I've got a headache and I, but I still need to work. Like I, I just have to, I have to keep working. I have to learn and send emails and read and have meetings and, and I just don't want to. And then I get home and I'm just shot, you know, and, and it was just, I was a bad employee that day. And so I started learning, like, maybe I shouldn't fast. But I have a lot of work to do. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe, maybe there's a better time to do that. Although what's interesting, after about two days, if you're doing an extended fast, yeah. After two days, your body begins to make that ketone transition and the crankiness goes away, the low energy goes away. Huh. I mean, you move into a burst of energy. You you have you have the brain fog goes away. You have clarity gotcha. right? because the body has shifted. The body chemistry has shifted. So start on a Saturday morning. So by Monday, you're good. Yeah. Oh, yeah. If, if you're on an extended fast. Absolutely. In fact, I one of the things I used to say is, man, why would you fast for a day when you could fast for a week? Meaning the hell of a fast is the first day. <laughs> After that is not so bad at all. But it's just getting over that that bodice you that bodice body chemistry shift that said there is value to fasting for a day like and we and we see that in scripture you know uh because your body is feeling all those things you are acutely aware hmm. of I'm this is different space, space yeah right and 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 you're able and that's where it's important to set aside time so you're not going through your regular routine if you're fasting for a day that's just stupid because you're not going to be any good to anybody you know and you're not going to get where the lord wants you to get no you got to create that space and and have the time to let the lord take your mind wherever he wants to take your mind scriptures you know that deeper journeying with the lord hmm. right now if, if you know extended fast yeah start friday night by by, by monday you're probably good to go and then um, uh, the fifth thing is just humbling oneself before the Lord. This is kind of like that act of obedience, you know, that, okay, I'm not the center of the universe. I, 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 I don't need to be 
energized for the battle because the battle belongs to the Lord. And I'm going to embrace that and enter into that in a real way during this, whatever, 24 hour period, you know, I, I like how it's also a thing that happened. Even, even in the old Testament example, we looked, it kept happening. It wasn't like, Oh, well, it's not like fast. You fast, right. Once. And you learn all you need to know. You know, it, it is a continual tool that keeps deepening your relationship. Yeah. So that's where you go back to your, you know, earlier question. I mean, how often and when and all of that, you know, I, you know, the national ritual of the, of the day of atonement fast for Israel. Okay. That, you know, that, that was an annual ritual that, that the whole nation kind of prepared for, you know, that's pretty cool. Kind of sad that we don't have that, you know, in the church Lent uh, used to be that you got the, fat tuesday the mardi gras thing you know but i think that's a distortion so it's, it's, it's just not part of our experience john john wesley would fast wednesdays and fridays he had a pretty regular he had a regular rhythm and and that's you know and and and, and that's what he did so i i think it's, it'd be valuable you know just to to taking fast seriously as a spiritual discipline to what, what, what would be an appropriate pattern, you know, be, being sensitive to the, you know, to, to the wife and to work. See, see for Chris teacher Monday through Friday, he, she's jamming man. I cannot fast Saturday because Chris is home. She needs my attention Sunday. I got to preach. I've got to, you know, being low energy is not good just before I'm, you know, leading worship, you know, you know, Friday, maybe, you know, yeah, that, 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 that feels like a, it could be a, a regular pattern, you know, right. And, and, and just being wise, you know, about that. I think, I think one thing that as we're, as we're wrapping up that like really is convicting for me and what you said is that even for, the, for these day fasts right like setting aside time so it's not just it's not just cutting yourself off from fuel to get in this space and to recognize but it also allow a portion of your of that time a good portion to be spent ready for god to do whatever he wants to do and you know as i think about that my flesh my my like oh man but okay if, if i if i'm working monday through friday and that means I got to fast on the weekend, but like my friends want to go out on Saturdays and then Sundays we have like food at church, you know, and it's like, oh, I maybe I'll do it during the week. But what that, what I'm doing is I'm like, I'm not, I, I'm not giving God his time uh, along with that in that space. So it, it is, it's convicting to me to, to want to, you know, what I, this is just personally just thinking about, okay, if I, if this, if this just be a regular spiritual discipline, it's also not just the discipline of fasting, but it's also the discipline of, of, you know, giving God a portion of, you know, I mean, a, a significant portion of, you know, my week, uh, or you know, my day, for that for that time. Yeah, yeah. So let so that good segue into Adele Calhoun's definition, you know, from the handbook uh, of fasting. Um, a fast is the self-denial of normal necessities in order to intentionally attend to God in prayer, bringing attachments and cravings to the surface. That's kind of what, uh, what you were just kind of speaking to. Bringing attachments and cravings to the surface uh, opens a place for prayer. This physical awareness of emptiness is the reminder to turn to Jesus who alone can satisfy. Right. So, you know, you, you know, so that's where fasting from social media, right. For, I'm going to fast for social media for a week. Right. Well, if, if that's become a, a regular pattern that energizes you for whatever reason, and all of a sudden you don't have that. Okay. That's okay. There's, a, I, I can understand that as a dimension of fasting. Right. Now don't watch TV instead of doing social media. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Right. Take that time and give it to the Lord. Right. I think that that is what's so powerful about uh, fasting from sustenance, because there's, it's hard to find a, 
a replacement placement yeah <laughs> for, for food you know yeah 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 i'm not i can't eat so i'm going to drink beer I'm, no I'm gonna, no <laughs> yeah yeah it's not like we can like sit out in the sun and be plants for that time yeah yeah it, it, yeah 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 so that's fasting and uh i guess in summary and again, in light, I mean, Matthew has framed this for me wonderfully, a seething world, a secret place. Fasting deepens that secret place uh, with the Lord. And it was far more common in Jesus's day than it is in ours. And there's a whole lot of wisdom around fasting that I think the church has lost that we need to rediscover. You know, so when you ask the question, well, how often should I fast? There's some place, you know, there's people around you. You can, you can say, well, this is what works for me. Right. And hear the Lord have opportunity to, you know, to, you know, to, to direct you. So fasting and powerful, powerful spiritual disciplines experienced it in my own life, experienced in the life of the church. And I commend it to you and to all who are listening. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. Not for personal pleasure, but for deepering intimacy. There, there it is. Hey, cl close, us, close us in prayer and we'll be done. Right. Oh, Heavenly Father, thank you for man, just the reminder that as we draw near to you, you draw near to us. And God, all these spiritual disciplines just being a way to draw near to you. Holy Spirit, I, I just ask that you uh, give us the and the wisdom to uh and and the the discipline the self-control uh which is which is a fruit of, of of you father to be able to um actually do it <laughs> to, to not just read about how how for generations and for um, not just for your people but it just seems just even as cultures for all around the world that just uh, these this discipline of, of fasting, um, not just reading about it and, and kind of understanding it in our minds, but really making it a part of our, uh, our walk with you um, so that we can, can just know you better and, um, and by that be more effective uh, in your kingdom and for this world. And we ask these things to you in all your name. Amen. Amen. Okay. Amen. Love to Hannah. Thanks, guy. I will. I will. Thanks for listening, everybody. <laughs> I commend fasting to you. Yeah, take care. Bye.